The effects of uh, exponential growth uh, in private markets is a theme that we're going to stick with into our next session. Um, I'm going to invite Antoine back onto the stage to host a panel with Mikkel Svenstrup of ATP and Marie-Victoire uh, Marie Rosé of Ardian, as we ask them to consider who has really benefited from exponential growth and what investors should be taking a closer look at and whether this is a moment of reckoning. Antoine. Thanks a lot, Matt. Good afternoon again, everyone. So after discussing the supermarkets of private equity platforms, it's perhaps time uh, to turn now to the ultimate consumers limited partners. After years of cheap debt, feverish fundraising, and low interest rates, the rising tide that has carried returns look, looks to have its, its peak. This panel looks ahead to what LPs should prioritize in this new era of private equity. It is my pleasure to welcome on stage Marie-Victoire Rosé, Senior Managing Director and Member of the Ardian Secondary Fund Management Committee. Welcome on stage, Marie-Victoire, Marie and Mikkel Svenstrup, Chief Investment Officer at ATP. So it was a pleasure to spend a good time with you this morning during this uh, LPAC meeting. So this is the LP-only session that we organized earlier this morning where we tackled most of the, the issues and we will try to deliver some of the big conclusions we had this morning, perhaps not all of them, uh, but I think we've had very candid discussions this morning and they will be probably very uh, useful to our, to our audience. Before starting, I'd like to introduce you um, to our audience. Uh, Marie-Victoire, thanks again for being with us. You've been with Ardian since 2015, where you are primarily engaged in the origination and evaluation of secondary purchases and the origination of co-investment for Ardian's flagship secondary fund. Let me remind the audience that Ardian, as the world's largest secondaries and primaries platform with more than $81 billion under management and over 1,600 funds in portfolio. I don't know if my figures are accurate. Uh, this is quite uh, a great observatory to comment on the latest trend uh, in the industry. Mikkel, thanks again, and uh, it's a pleasure to welcome you as well. You joined ATP as Chief Investment Officer back in 2020. Uh, ATP, for our audience, is Denmark's uh, largest and one of Europe's largest pension plans uh, with uh, $150 billion under management. Prior to joining ATP, you were CIO of P+, Plus, another Danish pension firm, and you work with Nordea Markets, sorry, Nordea Markets, UBS, and Barclays. ATP is very regular, regularly praised for being one of the most innovative and sophisticated uh, asset owners in Europe, and it has been active in private markets for decades uh, with its ATP PEP, is that correct, <laughs> Mikkel, uh, platform, which manages around 10 billion or so euros uh, in private market assets. So th the conversation started this morning uh, with a very interesting, can we say that, Mikkel? You, <laughs> you decide. <laughs> I thought it was interesting, uh, presentation uh, by, um, uh, by yourself. The, you commented on uh, the exponential growth that private equity uh, has enjoyed in the last uh, decade and uh, kind of described private markets as, uh, you're not the only one actually <laughs> to say so, how uh, private markets may have been a bit on steroids uh, with low interest rates and, um, and uh, growing, forever growing valuations. Can you share a bit about your key comments this morning or at least the one you can share with us today? Yes, of course. Uh, hi, everybody. Um, I think that just to, before you uh, hear this kind of IPEM meeting, you know, just to give you a bit of background, ATP has been investing in the in the private markets for decades in various forms, and we're investing across the plat all platforms and all capital structures. So, um, but one of the things that you know have changed, and one of the things that we work on in ATP particularly is the most important thing for us as an LP is alignment of interest. And one of the things that we've seen, it, alignment, a good alignment of interest makes everything easier when you go and do a business deal with somebody. One of the challenges we see, first of all, is that we don't really, 
we, to a certain extent, we, are, we, not, we don't always agree on what is value creation. What does value creation mean when we're talking private markets? Something it's value creation is returns above 8% hurdle rate. So, you know, some things it's, uh, you know, how do, we, how do we structure deals where we can in align incentives? And one of the things that I've been saying here that, uh, to this morning is that to a certain extent, particularly, I know it's a very competitive market, and just, it's not because I don't believe in capitalism, but there is no doubt that over the last uh, couple of decades, the funds have grown to, and the platforms has grown to a size where all the economies of scale has gone to the GPs and not to the LPs. And this is the kind of, uh, this is one of the statements that, you know, some obviously, uh, if you go to the LP uh, meetings, they will all agree, and I'm sure that the GPs will think that they earned the money. The problem here is, you know, how do we structure transactions and relationships that, you know, get that kind of alignment of interest back? You know, this is, was one of the, my main concerns. Um, uh, also, what you can see nowadays, and you see in you know, the last couple of years, is that you know that I think the participants in these markets are changing. It's becoming much more, you know, broad-based from being a niche specialist kind of professional investor kind of mandate. Now we're bringing in you know smaller funds. We have high net worth individuals. If it's being sold to a certain wrapped in retails, so it's a kind of a different thing. And you know, for us as investors, you know. Obviously, competition is also annoying, right? And if you're competing with somebody who has a lower return target than you, then you know at some point you need to figure out whether you want to be in that market or not, right? It's quite simple. So <clears throat> let's assume that we uh, all agree that you know we define value creation as high returns or high RRs over the last couple of years. There is no doubt that we've done well, right? You know, if you do that metrics, but we should. The PE model should do well in this kind of economics. It's not like expanding multiples, lower rate, lots of credit, change structural changes in the banking industry, and you know cheap credit via private debt markets. All of these things have been going one direction. You know, my concern is that those kind of things are changing, and we probably we feel that we are reckoning. And you know, I, I'm not saying this now with a benefit of hindsight. This is actually the reason why Anton asked me to come and talk more than almost a year ago uh, when we had this kind of discussion. So I'm not just sitting here and saying, and I know some of these things are happening, and but I don't think it's, it's been quite, quite clear uh, for the last couple of years. And one of the concerns that we have seen as well is that, you know, we are big, we are a big fund investor. We have hundreds of funds in our and, thousands of portfolio companies down in the in the investment channel we see what well, we see in the, particularly in 2001 right that more than 80 percent of the exits for our investments was done either to secondaries or to other gps or continuation funds you know this is this is not good business right this is the start what that potentially i'm saying potentially a pyramid scheme right everybody's selling to each other Mark to market, banks are lending against it because it's obviously an arm's length transaction, so it must be a valuation. So these are the concerns I've been sharing this morning. What were your first reactions to Mikael's presentation this morning? Well, I thought it was very, uh, very interesting. Obviously, having the double hat of being an LP and a GP, uh, I, uh, there are some areas where I agree, some others where we can have discussion, and we had interesting discussion this, uh, this morning. So first on the growth, for sure, it has benefited to the GPs, no question. But I think as LPs, we have also benefited from that growth, whether it's you know, about liquidity events. We had a lot of distribution. We were able to send cash back to our LPs, recycle the distribution to build up further our program. So I think there was also some benefit to, to, to our LPs, no, no question. I think on the management fee slash per fee debate, uh, the discussion was quite uh, interesting also this morning. I think, yes, management fee, becomes a priority for many GPs, but the reality is that you don't raise a new fund if you don't perform. So I think there is a sanction at some point uh, by DLP. So I think it's, it's, you need to perform, and management fee cannot be the only, uh, the only goal. So that's, uh, that was uh, a point we also discussed uh, uh, this morning. Clearly, market is changing. Uh, we need to all adapt uh, to use probably a better power in the LPNs, no question. That was also one of the key takeaways this morning, and we might talk about it later on. But uh, yeah, so this is my view uh, in general. 
And good news is that the markets are currently difficult. Um, does it rebalance, you think, uh, the power between LPs and GPs? And do you think you, you will have the same comments in 12, <laughs> 24 months, Michael? Uh, what's your opinion? I think that, well, I can say what we've been doing, you know, I want, you know and obviously uh, one of the things that we've been looking at is, you know, who are the key partners we have, who's been behaving, right? Who's been having this, I have this, I'll say it again here and don't shoot me again, it's one of the things. The general partners, GP and limited partners, LP kind of relationship, I think there's something that is quite not correct in that statement because there is a partners in those two, right? I said this morning jokingly, but there's certain truth in it, in my, in my own opinion, is that the general managers and limited clients is probably a more fair statement. Um, <clears throat> so, so obviously, we will, we've been looking very carefully about who's, obviously, our managers they need to perform, but also who's been tweaking it, who's been pushing, uh, you know, who's been pushing the boat out and, and, and taking every single dime on table, who's been very, who's been using bridge financing, who's been using the uh, leverage fund, basically buying on the back end, all those kind of tricks that they do to just manipulate the IRR. We will definitely have a look at them. And we have been, you know, cutting down on our managers and, and, and we will continue to do that. Uh, for this kind of, a, you know, I don't think that, I don't think that, uh, yeah, there's a dry period now. There's a lot of dry powder out there. So, you know, a lot of deals will be done. We know that. Uh, there, Everybody's incentive to, uh, to, to, to draw that cash and spend it. It's not that I think that the PE market is going to drop off a cliff, right? It's just, we're just going to be looking into potentially low return and high costs. That's, that's a problem. It's not a catastrophe. Marie Victoire, taking your limited client hat, uh, been the last few months, uh, and uh, what will you do in the next few months? You think? I think we'll try to to take advantage as a primary LP because we do both primary and secondary. We'll try to take advantage of a bit more power on the LP side, so negotiating, if possible, better terms. It can be higher ratio of co-investments, uh, you know, uh, stronger requirements on ESG, uh, and that sort of thing. So I think that's something we'll try to to push uh, as much as we as we can. The discussing. The discussion we're having this morning is that it's the trend is starting to be felt, but it's not yet that you see major uh, changes compared to what you were able probably to negotiate six, nine months uh, ago. But I think as the volatility continues, that's something certainly that we'll try to, to leverage on for sure. And on the secondary, obviously, uh, the dislocation is creating opportunities, uh, clearly an acceleration of the deal flow. So there is a growth which is inherent to what has been raised on the primary side, for sure, but it's the volatility is accelerating, for sure, the need of liquidity for some LPs who are over-allocated, who have pressure to re-up with their GPs, who are using the secondary market as a way to free up capital to be able to support those GPs. Uh, they have the conviction to the LPs that it will be probably good vintages, that they don't want to miss. Some of them missed that during the last GFC, and so we see that trend of, in fact, LPs using for the first time the secondary market. And so for us as a buyer, that dislocation creates that opportunity of a, of a bigger deal flow. Do you share that approach, Mika? Yeah, I think we always push for better deals. And, uh, and I think it, this is, comes back to the pan partnership discussion, right? We will try to, obviously, we'll try to uh, bar make a hard bargain. We always do, right? But it, it comes back to what I said about the partnership approach, right? If we have a good relationship, you know, then we'll obviously do our best to support the managers we have, right? And we want to stay in the relationship. We want <clears throat> to get to a situation where we have a repeated game where, you know, Good, good behavior being, is being rewarded with more deals, more money, and uh, uh, but it's just the question is how do we get that measured frequently enough so it's not just a you know ten year fund and then we evaluate in ten years and nobody really uh, sees what's what's going on down in the machine room. So yeah, but I think that's going to happen. I think also it was a feedback, a, a general feedback on the LP uh, on the LP. Uh, meeting this morning that people are thinning out managers, more concentrated relationships, smaller ticket sizes, uh, higher co-investment requirements, etc. I think that's, you know, I'm not saying that, you know, 
I think there is a limit, right? There's the exponential growth we've seen in this industry and the amount of capital that's gone into it. At some point, it will stop. That's simply math, right? You know, if you have that kind of growth rate, it will stop at some point. And this kind of uh, reckoning or this kind of dislocation, or you want to call it, was just a question of time. But the question is was more there, like how. Also, I think you know, for a lot of you who are not in the fund management industry, it's also about. I think the private markets sometimes think they operate in a kind of a vacuum, and you know that you know the public markets are the clients just can get cash out of somewhere. But obviously, most professional investors had a horrible year this year, so private markets are less down. So if you were under, you can probably go, you can be, have been going from being under allocated to private markets to over allocated in, into private markets just because of the numerator effect as we discussed. And I think that's the case for a lot of the people we spoke, of, spoke to with this morning. If you were to be gloomy, do you think private equity can uh, have its uh, hedge fund moment as the hedge fund had? I don't think that's going to happen. And I don't think, th I think there's a different kind of, I think that private markets plays a very important role in the economy. I think that, you know, private equity is a key driver of, you know, taking some companies from one step to the next and eventually, hopefully, getting IPO'd or owned by some long term owners. So, I don't think that's going to happen uh, with private equity, but I do think that I don't think it will blow up. As I said, I think that's potential for just having lower returns. Now, Mikael mentioned a lot, uh, stressed a lot about building great partnerships uh, with um, uh, with GPs. What's your approach uh, at Ardian, uh, and what do you think is the the good step to take for any GP now? I think it's it's a key priority of, of course for us to build valuable relationship with our LPs, strategic type of relationships. And I think uh, it's always been a part of our DNA. It can take many forms. So that can be higher co-investments on the secondary side, for example, we've been one of the largest provider of you know big dollar amount of co-investments, which our LPs like. You know, it's about level of um, of client servicing that you can uh, bring to your client, having a very local approach. Uh, we have, as you know, 15 offices. We operate very locally, uh, which is something that our LPs value. That's part also of the close relationship we want to build with, uh, with them. Having the benefit of also having a lot of expertise, having a global presence, that's something our LPs value to be able to, you know, it can be a client on the buy outside who wants to pick up on, a, on infra theme. We can bring that holistic uh, uh, view, for example. So that's the way we try to, um, uh, build as strategic uh, as possible um, type of, uh, of partnerships. But the client is really at the heart of, uh, of everything we, we do, for sure. Moving first to ESG, uh, it was a big focus as well today, this morning, uh, and probably a tool, you think, to uh, realign or better align interest between LPs and GPs? I don't think there's a conflict of interest here. I think our belief is that it's good business to be having control of both ES and G. I think it's been all. I think it's probably been more <clears throat> historically. You know, we've been discussing governance. We've been stuffing social, supply chain management. We've been discuss, discussing all these kind of things with our companies, and now it's the ease coming into focus with the climate crisis, etc. So, I don't think it's it's not something new in that sense, but it's just it's been a change of focus, and obviously now it's at the forefront of everything, but. It is, we believe it's a value driver. We also believe it's an intangible asset. So it's, you can have a different opinion than I about the importance of a certain kind of parameter. But one thing we believe is that data is a good thing. So knowledge about what's going on, we can have our opinions, you know, that, that that's valuable information as an investor. What about you? Yeah, no, I think it's definitely a good time to push our GPs even further on ESG. So on our side, and I think Mikael is doing the same, but we, 10 years, more than 10 years ago, we launched a, a survey, a questionnaire that we send annually to most of our GPs. Uh, it's, a, it's a set of uh, close to 50 questions, 5 zero, that we are trying to narrow as much as we can. And of course, it's time consuming for the GPs. In the meantime, they do like the feedback they're getting. They do like to discuss their rating, to compare with the prior year, compare to their peers as well. It's something that they value, but it takes time. And I think some always would push back a little bit and so on. So that's the good moment, I think, to push further uh, on that, to be even more demanding with our GPs, whether it's through those questionnaires, through the side letters uh, requirements. I think, again, um, the power being more on the LPNs right now, I think that's, uh, we should take this opportunity, basically, to push further on that, uh, on that front, for sure. If I, 
Yeah, if just maybe one more, ATP has a kind of an ESG strategy, and you know the board in ATP decided last year that in 2025, all the companies we invest in, they need to report. They need to disclose both CO2 but also other measures. So <clears throat> it's not a hard target for a European company, given the European taxonomy is coming and the SFDR is coming. But obviously, on a global portfolio, that's going to be uh, some more challenging discussions. We are kicking off today our uh, IPM Goes Green uh, project, uh, chartering a, a train from Paris to to, to Cannes, etc. Um, I'd like to have your comments about your respective views on climate investing uh, and why you are currently uh, tackling that that that, uh, that issue. I, I know you're quite serious about it at ATP. We'll be, we're quite serious about it. We don't have targets. We the purpose of ATP is not to make green investments. The purpose of ATP is to pay high pensions. When that is said, you know. We have a defined benefit scheme. We need to have a provide a lifelong guarantee. But once that is said, <clears throat> we still think there are opportunities in, in the green transition. And I think uh, the board last year had a ambition to invest about uh, 200 billion Danish kroner in, uh, in, in the green transition and green assets, green bonds across the spectrum over the next 10 years. So uh, quite a big commitment to, uh, to but, but it's very, really important to say we really will get there, but it's not a target as such, it's an ambition. And that comes back to measurement. How do we measure? I don't think it's very important in, to start. We know which direction we're going to go. Then we can start about talking percentage and uh, taxonomy and all kinds of things. But, you know, there's a lot of, I'm fairly sure, at least, at least in Europe, if there is a, an attractive green project with a decent return and risk profile, it will not lack funding, neither from ATP or from other investors. So I think that's a good thing. Yeah, and on our side, on the on the fund of fund side, we see increasing demand from our clients on the primary side to have this type of mandates, customized solution dedicated to energy transition. So we're developing those. Um, it's small at this stage, but clearly something where we see a lot of growth. Good managers also entering that market. Establish one um, on the infra side, for example, we are expanding to that uh, that segment, uh, which is something interesting for us. So that's something we closely monitor that we're starting to deploy, and we hope to replicate that uh, for many other clients. A last surprise question, perhaps. <laughs> I was asked in the air just before uh, entering the room uh, by a journalist what, what was the mood of the industry. Uh, and so I'd be interested to know how you feel as we open IPEV today and what you are expecting uh, of the next three days? Mm, I'd say given the financial markets, if you saw a half yearly report, you think that mood was really, 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 really bad. <laughs> it's been a very tough year for a lot of investors. It's kind of interesting, right? Because private markets seems to still keep their valuations. And I don't know, you know, when we talk about correlation between private markets and public markets, it's a mood point that you know they just operate on a different time span. So some some will eventually they will converge. Whether it's going to be on to the upside or to the downside, the time will show, right? But um, I, I'll fairly say let's let's see what happens uh, when uh, distributions has been fairly attractive the last couple of years, right? So uh, I think that will show. Peter. On our side, I think obviously first very happy to, to be back here, to be all together, to hear about our colleagues, about our peers in the industry for sure. And the mood in general is to be cautious, but also to be ready to take advantage of that dislocation and to basically leverage on our strength uh, to, to be able to navigate at best this new uh, environment. That's the, the mood for us. Thank you, Wes. Really appreciate the conversation we had this morning and, 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 and the panel we had today. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.